I have the great pleasure of introducing to you our keynote speaker for today, Erin Bailey San. She is a source of great inspiration to me, and I'm sure that she will be to you too. Uh, first time I met Erin was in Seattle. She was the curator and coordinator of an exhibition called Revealing Queer at the Museum of History and Industry, the Mohai in Seattle. Uh, that was an exhibition that changed the way that the Mohai works, and I think it made a great impact on, on society as well. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we will hear a bit more about the exhibition Re Revealing Queer, uh, but we will also hear more about Erin's project, Queering the Museum, which she co-founded. Uh, Queering the Museum is a platform that engages museums across disciplines, and it shares the value of having an open discussion to bring awareness about the work that is already being done in museums, considering queer perspectives and LGBTQ perspectives. Today, Erin Bailey-San uh, is working at the, Washington, the University of Washington, and she is um, an international speaker, I must say, on, on the museum scene. You have spoken a number of times at the AAA, AAM conference in the United States. Uh, Last week, I think you spoke at the Museum Association conference in the UK, and you even got to speak about LGBTQ perspectives in Moscow, Russia. St. Petersburg, sorry. That's quite impressive. Uh, I would like to welcome Erin Bailey's son up on stage. We are very happy to have you here. Thank you. The stage is yours. Before we get started today, I want to thank both Evelina and the museum and all of you for having me here. It is a great honor to be sharing my work with you. As Evelina mentioned, I am Erin Baileyson, and I will be talking about my work as co-founder with Queering the Museum Project, as well as the partnership that we developed with Mohai to open Revealing Queer. And we'll, I'll also share a brief conversation about the politics of exhibiting queer narratives in US museums. So as many of us know, museums are political. They're political because they talk about um, narratives of people. And as Judith Butler said, the body is political. And since every exhibition and program that museums open or engage with has stories of narratives, they are inherently political. An object tells a story of a time, a place, a community, an event. All of this places the person at the center of the story. When thinking about queer narratives, it's critical to be aware of what is the margin and what is the mainstream in society. Kimberly, Cook, Kimberly Keith does a good job of describing that in this quote here, where she says, if social justice is to be achieved through collaboration, the delicate balance of power and precarious relationships between the margin and the mainstream must be addressed and negotiated by individual practitioners and implemented through their respective organization. In this particular quote, she brings in the individual museum professional, all of you in this room who are making space to include queer narratives in museums around the world. When thinking about queer narratives, I'm sure that we can all share stories about how difficult it's been to gain institute narratives in our exhibitions, our programs, and our collections. As society changes their moral positions on queer lives, it, it allows institutional support for including these topics more directly. Every time we open a new exhibition or a program, we gain in a deeper understanding of the influences and understandings of queer lives. Richard Sandel talks at length about how museums mediate and are influenced by moral positions when making content decisions. However, it is the individual museum professionals who continue to push these boundaries and gain access for queer narratives in even the most conservative of museums. It's these museum professionals that allow Kylie Message's idea of curatorial activism to, be, to continue to create change at a societal level. The idea of curatorial activism resonates with both my career inside and outside of museums, but I think that recognizing the time in which you are doing any kind of activism is important for understanding its impact on the field at large. 
As um, I may have mentioned, I began my work with Queering the Museum Project in late 2011, in the middle of President Barack Obama's first term as our president, as well as just a few months before he openly supported same-sex marriage. This led to several other efforts from his office to support queer communities around the country. While his efforts can be debated and have been heavily debated about their influence on the individual lives of LGBTQ people living in the United States, it did create a window of opportunity for me to access museums. When the leader of your country is supporting queer lives, it's harder for a museum to create a case to censor you. And as a result, it was this change, among many other changes that happened in the United States in the last five years, that allowed my work to be possible. Here you have a couple of examples of some things that President Obama did. I don't mean to make him sound like he is the savior to LGBTQ communities because there are still a ton of inequality in the United States and globally that has yet to be addressed. But when the leader of your country opens his, uses his power to support, it's, it should be recognized in regards to the overarching theme. So to summarize a little bit about why museums are political, especially in the United States, I think it's important to remember that they are political because they strive to curate a collective identity. They, promise, they possess a tremendous amount of organizational strength. They amass the power of the government. They write and rewrite national narratives. And these narratives embody public sentiments and political values. So now let's get into the details of my work. In 2011, I co-founded Queering the Museum Project. Evelina did a great job of describing the work that I've done with Queering the Museum Project. Um, my co-founder, Nicole Robert, and I started it as a way to investigate how museums are engaging with LGBTQ communities, why, where the resources are, and how to create a community of advocates within museums. We started this with a series of lectures in 2012 that supported the Hide Seek Difference in Desire in American Portraiture Exhibition, which originally opened in 2010 at the National Portrait Gallery, but then traveled to a museum in our region shortly thereafter. Um, this exhibition was groundbreaking in the United States, and I would argue globally, as it was the first museum that was federally funded by the government to support direct LGBTQ narratives. Furthermore, this exhibition was censored. Censored so much that it created a wave of protests from both visitors and professionals alike. It made a big splash in our field. But it was this work that led us to develop a partnership with the Museum of History and Industry. We had gained a little bit of a following, had proved that we could do the work that we were doing and that we had the knowledge and experience to, to lead change. And we developed a partnership with Mohai. The partnership determined that Nicole, my co-founder, would organize a digital storytelling workshop, which is a self-directed oral history project, and I would curate Revealing Queer. Um, Revealing Queer opened in February of 2013 and um, to a sold-out opening party, the first of its kind at Mohai, and was opened until July of 2014. I think it's important to note that uh, Mohai had never addressed LGBTQ topics in a standalone exhibition in their history. They did have a couple of objects on permanent display, but that was only after they moved into a brand new building in 2012, I think it was. Um, so they had never really explored this topic in depth. And Seattle is known as a very progressive and queer-friendly city, so it was a bit of a misnomer as to why Mohai had never done that. However, Revealing Queer came into its fruition in, in 2013. It was not only attempting to create a collective narrative around the multitude of queer identities, it was also directly engaging community voices. Revealing Queer developed a community advisory committee, a CAC as we called it, and this included LGBTQ activists, leaders, community members, youth, anyone that was willing to come and tell their stories as they lived them in the region. Um, the, we did this because I am young. I wasn't alive for most of the things that we were talking about or had hoped to talk about in the exhibition. And so we wanted to get firsthand experience from those who were do, leading the change in the 70s, who were able to give us the, the records that aren't in the archives and really give us a full picture of what Seattle looked like um, over the last 40 years of its history which is the timeline of the exhibition. It was designed to address the last 40 years of LGBTQ history in the greater Seattle area, which coincided with the first Pride Festival that we had in Seattle in 1973, arguably 1974. The archive is still in debate. However, the CAC did everything from selecting and securing objects to helping us edit the exhibition text, helping us name it. Um, 
They shaped the programming and they were given the opportunity to write their histories into the archives. The exhibition itself focused on five major themes, including regional law and policy, celebrations, community organizations, individual narratives that were otherwise left out, and language. Revealing Queer aimed to provide those who didn't identify as LGBTQ with a foundation to have a deeper conversation with people they knew about LGBTQ identities, as well as educate the region about why Seattle is historically known as a progressive and queer-friendly town. We wanted people to fall back in love with Seattle because of the LGBTQ communities. Not only did we want people to fall back in love with Seattle because of the LGBTQ communities, we also wanted to validate their histories therein. It's not uncommon to see a lack of LGBTQ objects and archives around the world. Even today, the publications in English regarding LGBTQ engagement are scattered and disjointed. Many professionals don't have places to look to gain an understanding of how museums have previously engaged with LGBTQ communities, and if you don't know your past, you can't build a future. In short, Revealing Queer was a success. There was no public outcry about the content. There was no censorship of the exhibition. Hundreds of people came to the exhibition daily, and Mohai was changed as a result. Mohai engaged with curatorial activism to help create a collective identity that, both Mo that Mohai was both political and community oriented. They continue to create opportunities for LGBTQ communities to engage and hopefully will continue to do that as the, uh, as the organization grows. With the closing of the exhibition, Mohai continues to grow their LGBTQ collection, strives to create a welcoming atmosphere, and overall, the way in which they engage their work is drastically different. They have a community gallery in which the exhibition was housed. However, prior to working with me, there had never been as involved of a process for incorporating community voices. It was more of a drop and plop, where somebody, any organization, would have a topic and they would put it into the exhibition. It wasn't as involved in developing the collection, changing the mentality, co-creating programming, so on and so forth. Even the way in which they think and talk about LGBTQ perspectives has changed at Mohai. Before, it was, they asked questions of me, like how do we engage LGBTQ communities? And my reaction was, the same way you engage everybody else. There's no difference. But I didn't understand that they had a hard time under, understanding intersectionality and the idea that people who identify as LGBTQ have a multitude of identities that they carry with them. And when you engage the whole person, then you are able to understand how to engage LGBTQ people, um, generally speaking. So after the exhibition closed, Nicole and I had to really consider what to do with crewing the museum project. Was it a platform that we had developed just for this one project to archive the work of this exhibition and this storytelling project, or could it be something more? Oops. I'm a little behind. Um, we, as the exhibition closed, we realized that we had made, um, given the lack of publications and the number of contacts that we had made with people doing this kind of work in the field, we realized that we had an opportunity to promote that work, to connect it, and to create a better understanding of how museums have already started engaging LGBTQ communities to reverse the idea that nothing was happening and that you were the first to do this kind of work because that's almost never true. So we turned Queering the Museum Project into a platform where we feature different voices every month that are addressing a different element of LGBTQ engagement in museums. It's an opportunity for colleagues to share their work with the field, a place for active scholars to connect with people working with LGBTQ communities. And for the last year, we have featured different voices each month um, about discussions from exhibition topics such as Rocking the Boat, Exhibition Methods of Storytelling and the Experience of Gender and Sexuality in Museums, a very long title for an article that talks about different ways of developing exhibitions through community voices. We've also engaged topics such, um, we had interviews with intersectional scholars, we've had people talk about exhibitions in Europe, so on and so forth, but for me, the most interesting one is mapping, you're not the most interesting, they're all very interesting. One that jumped out at me was Mapping Q, which comes from Arizona, which is a predominantly Republican country, or state in the United States, very conservative, very right-wing, very not, I wouldn't consider them LGBTQ friendly, or friendly at all in some contexts. 
However, there is a particularly um, incredible museum at the State University down there that developed a program to engage queer youth in art museums and in a similar fashion to how I worked with the community at Mohai. So these are the kinds of topics that we engage and we invite people to, um, to feature their work in any capacity in any way that they wish in a really safe and conducive way. And we hope that some of you will consider sharing some of your work with us as well so that we can continue the dialogue. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Erin. Mm -hmm. What would be your top three advices for a museum that are about to integrate LGBTQ perspectives for the very first time since you have the experience? I, mean. I would say don't be afraid because it's not going to hurt your museum. You're not going to lose funding. You're not going to alienate community members. It'll be all right. Just give it a whirl. Um, I would also say to incorporate the community is critical. Not only is it important for the outcome of the product, but also for your institution to engage the voices of the people who live them. And also, I would probably say, have fun with it. It's a really fun topic. It can, it can be really explicit. It can be really normalized. It can be a lot of different things. So find what fits right for your audience and for your museum and have fun with it. I love that advice. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. Questions, comments? Otherwise, oh, we have one then there. Uh, yes, I was wondering about your advisory uh, committee. Uh, how did you find the persons who were in it and did you get a uh, wide spectra of people, uh, especially thinking of intersectional perspective? And uh, did they get paid or did they give you their research and stuff for free? That's a really great question and something that we grappled with quite a bit. So the recruitment for the Community Advisory Committee was very broad. We sent an initial email to every, every organization that we could find in the greater Seattle area, and then we went to them. We went to their coffee shops or to their meetings or to their events and said, hey, we're doing this crazy thing with Mohai. Do you want to come join us? And one of the things that I will say about this, the LGBTQ communities in Seattle is that when there is a need in the community, they arise around it. And that's kind of a trust that I placed on them before I ever actually talked to them. In hindsight, I saw that. Um, but we did try to get as many people as we could. Um, and we invited organizations and community members, encouraged them to invite their friends. Um, a lot, some people said no, because a lot of organizations that engage LGBTQ topics are short-staffed and fighting really big issues like homophobia. So I wouldn't want to take them away from that, that busy work. But what we tried to do to help ease the, the lift of coming to the meetings every month over the course of two years was to invite them to send anybody from their organization, any representative who was available that particular month to come and be the voice for Entre Hermanos, which is a Latino LGBTQ organization in Seattle. And as we went through the process, we were really detailed in our note taking and our minutes that we sent back out as a way to kind of inform the organization or the person coming in about the previous conversations, allowing them to progress the conversation forward. Um, and no, they did not get paid, except for in my love and gratification for many years to come. I will continue to thank them. It was like sitting around a table with the 12 best parents you could ever possibly hope to have because they've lived through everything that you're going to live through and they know everything and they're just ready to tell you exactly how it is. Hi. Um, I was wondering, so with your work with, the, with these uh, advisory councils, um, would you say that uh, addressing them as, because you were doing this uh, as consultants yourselves, uh, saying, being able to say, we're doing this crazy thing with Mohai, uh, is that a different position and, and sort of um, a prerequisite? or? Would you think that uh, if you were completely within Mohai, coming as this larger sort of cultural institution, would you have the same possibility to reach out and get the same response? Or was, it, was your position um, kind of a, a success factor? 
I think that's a really interesting question because I started this project as a graduate student at the University of Washington, never have curated anything before in my life. And so when I went to these people, I came to them very humbly and said, I have no idea what I'm doing, come help me. However, over the course of time, Mohai gave me the fancy title of curator and brought me on staff and said, hey, we want you to do this legit, please don't leave this project halfway through. And that changed things for me a little bit. I had to renegotiate what it meant to be a curator what it meant to call myself a curator of an exhibition that was being developed by the community. And I had to, le I had to leverage that power thoughtfully. So in moments when it made sense for me to get that, the, uh, the, rec or the, the respect of other people, like funders, for example, I am absolutely a curator, 100%. When I'm with the community, I'm not a curator. I'm but a liaison between you and the organization. And it's really important to keep that relationship balanced, to keep the trust continued throughout the entire process. Thank you. Question down there. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, Emil from... Uh, from um, um, Linköping University. Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit sim the same question that I asked Bridget before about um, separatism and assimilation and integration and what you prefer and what do you think it's if they are uh, different tools in the same box or if they are different boxes. I don't know if you understand my question, or, uh, because of. I don't really understand myself right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I've been there before, so I understand. And I think that you're asking about the tools that I use to develop the exhibition as a separate exhibition versus integrating it into the whole museum. I think that's a great topic and something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, Mohai did have a small display in their permanent exhibition that had one sign of one bar in Seattle from the 70s, and that was it. And you could, you could call that integration, absolutely. And they tried to with me for months. And I had to argue that having one sign in the social movement section of your museum is not an LGBTQ section of your museum. There's much more depth that needs to, be, needs to go into. However, with Revealing Queer, what it did is that it, it, be, it was kind of like a foot in the door, if you will. It was an opportunity for us to um, kind of like sneak in to the museum and mess things up a little bit and leave them with this really stunning project at the end to allow them to understand that they can take risks in both content and contractors and community and that it's going to work out in the end because they need to invest trust in their staff, in the community, as well as in the field at large. So I think there's pros and cons to having separate exhibitions versus integrated exhibitions. There's a lot more um, research and thinking that needs to happen around those two topics. I hope that answers your question. Erin, how has this one exhibition changed changed the Mohai, the museum? Absolutely. So Mohai changed dramatically as a result of this exhibition. Um, they are thinking about their community galleries differently. Um, instead of just having someone come in and put a very traditional, very standard exhibition in there, they are now integrating um, community consultants in a different way. Their collecting has changed um, since the exhibition. They had a small collection and they've grown it since then. But also, recent, shortly after, or perhaps at the end of the exhibition, Mohai um, <laughs> accessioned in the first marijuana into their legalized marijuana, and that was very radical. And there was a lot of people who were like, how do you preserve marijuana into perpetuity? How do you, like, what do you just, like, how do you describe that in the archive? Like, do you get, do you, it's, there's so many questions about how you go about engaging. When will you display a bag of marijuana? However, Mohai collected it, and it's in their archive. And so they've, they haven't become more lenient with what they accept, but they've been more conscious of the choices that they make. And the language that they use in their programming has changed as well. They, um, at first, they were afraid of the word queer. And I had to talk at length about the, re the reclamation of the word. But at the end, it was the director who selected the title. Well, he shortened a longer title down to Revealing Queer. And that was really profound of him to be so confident in both the project and his institution to put the Q word right front and center, which is, I think, incredible for them. And they've changed the way that they've done community work as well. So it's kind of across the board, it seems like each individual department of Mohai has a better understanding of how to do community work, how to talk and engage with LGBTQ communities, and how to collect objects that 100 years from now, I'm sure will confuse many.
but that's what they do now. <laughs> that's amazing how much impact one exhibition can make for, yeah. for a museum. Uh, thank you so much for coming all the way to Sweden and sharing your story. My pleasure. And uh, well, if you have more questions for Erin, please find her in our traditional Swedish fika break later. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.